All right, so hi everyone and welcome to another meeting of the data visualization with R book club um, for the R for data science online learning community. Today we'll be discussing chapter nine, which is other graphs. And our learning objectives for today are to cover graphs that can be very useful, but don't easily um, don't easily fit in with the other chapters we've already reviewed. And these, these graphs will include 3D scatter plots, by plots, bubble charts, flow diagrams, heat maps, radar charts, scatter plot matrices, waterfall charts, and word clouds. <clears throat> okay, so 3D scatter plots. Now, since ggplot2, since the ggplot2 package and its extensions can't create a 3D plot, we can create 3D scatter plot with scatter plot 3D function in the scatter plot 3D package. So first, let's plot automobile by mileage versus engine displacement displacement versus car weight using the data in the empty cars data frame. Um, empty cars comes with base R and it contains information on 32 cars measured on 11 variables. Okay, so first we call the library for scatterplot 3D, and then with empty cars we do scatterplot 3D where our X is the displacement. Our Y is the weight and Z is the miles per gallon. And then we have our title 3D scatterplot example one. So yeah, again, we see that X on our X axis here is displacement. It's like the horizontal, yeah, displacement. And then here our Y is the weight. And then here our Z is the miles per gallon. Okay, so like modifying our scatterplot. Here we're going to modify the previous graph by replacing the points with filled blue circles, adding drop lines to the XY plane, and creating more meaningful labels. So it basically starts out with that same code we had again, where it's um, the library scatterplot 3D. And with the empty cars, within the scatterplot 3D function, we call our X, Y, and Z, which are displacement, weight, and miles per gallon. And then we have color is equal to blue for those solid blue lines, um, solid blue circles, and PCH is equal to 19. That's for the, the shape of the point. So specifically the color blue and the shape is the solid circle. And then type is equal to H draws the horizontal the line to the horizontal plane. So that's, again, where displacement is our X and weight is our Y, this is the XY plane. So we have our dots and then the line goes down to that X, Y plane. And then we have the labels. Um, this one, our main title, 3D scatterplot example two, the X label displacement in cubic inches. The Y label is weight by uh, pounds per, per thousand. And our X label is miles per US gallon. And then, okay. Sorry, I'm trying to find the next button. Okay. <laughs> okay, so next we have um, continuation of modifying 3D scatter plots. And here we label the points, and we could do this by saving the results of the scatter plot 3D plot function to an object, and then using the xyz.convert function to convert coordinates from 3D, which would be xyz, to 2D projections just the xy and then applying the text function to add labels to the graphs so again starting off with that um the stuff we have from the most recent plot where we call the library scatterplot 3d and with empty cars here we're um naming our object naming the results from that scatterplot to an object which we're calling s3d um so yeah doing the scatterplot 3d with X displacement, Y is weight, and Z is miles per gallon. The color is equal to blue, and the, the point is gonna be 19, which is the solid blue circle, the solid circle, and times is equal to H to have the horizontal line to the X, Y plane. And then we have our title, which is 3D scatter plot example three, and the labels we have from the previous, the previous um, example. And now here we're converting the 3D coordinates to 2D projections. And we're gonna call these S3D um, dot chords. 
Um, to that, yeah, so we're assigning, or rather, yeah, assigning to that from that object, the previous object we made, which is the S3D. And then we're extracting the, um, the coordinate, the 2D projection using the xyz.convert um, and within that fu function and then with that in that we're doing displace weight and mpg um, so then within that object we're then getting the text from that object so that we're extracting from it the x which would be our displacement and then the y which would be our weight and then we're labeling um, we're labeling based on the row names within empty cars. And this just changes the text. It shrinks it to 50% and places the points to the right of the dot versus it being right on top of the dot. And I can show you the difference of that as well. But yeah, so here we see, now we see that, like, oops. <laughs> now, from the previous chart to this one, we see that the names of the observations, well, the which are cars, are next to each of the points. So yeah, we look from the previous one to this one. That's basically what we did. We added the names. And then, so then as a final step, we'll add information on the number of cylinders in each car. And to do this, we'll add a column to the empty cars data frame, indicating the color of each point. We'll shorten the Y axis and change the drop lines to dash lines and add a legend. And then, so again, we call our library. And then here we're creating the columns indicating the point color. So the column we're creating is called P color. And then within P color, we're choosing, we're extracting the empty cars based on the cylinders that are equal to four. And those are going to be assigned red. Um, and then we're doing the same thing for cylinders, which are six. And those are going to be blue. And then the ones with eight cylinders, those are going to be dark green. And then all of this is the information we did from the previous, the previous plot. But then we're going to add our legend. So it's going to be in the top left within the plot versus the outside of it. That's our location. And then BTY is equal to N suppresses the legend box. So instead of it being like outlined in a box, it's just there by itself. And then CX equals to 0 .0 0 0.5 is shrinks our text 50%. And then the title of our legend is number, number of cylinders. And these are each of the, um, each of the, I don't want to call it objects exactly, but these are the numbers of cylinders four, six, or eight. And then again, the colors that we had assigned before red, blue, or dark green. So we have that there. And we see a lot of the four cylinders here, and then the six cylinders here, and then the eight cylinders, which are green here. So now we can easily see that the car with the highest mileage. So mileage on the Z axis was um, Toyota Corolla, and it has the lowest displacement where displacement is on the X axis. And then low weight, um, low weight. So basically, yeah, low weight with the Y or weight is on the Y. And then it also has four cylinders, which we can see from the legend because it's a red point. <laughs> And then next we'll have a biplot. Now a biplot is a specialized graph, which is useful in principal components analysis that attempts to represent the relationship between observations, between variables, and between observations and variables in a low, usually two-dimensional space. And here we create a biplot for the empty cars data set using the fviz underscore PCA function from the facto extra package to produce a ggplot2 graph. So we load our data, data um, MT cars, and then fit a principal component model, and we assign that to fit. And the PR PR comp within that function, x is equal to MT cars, center is equal to true, and scale is equal to true. 
and then we plot the results. So we call our library Facto Extra, and then within the fbiz underscore PCA function, we do fit, which is that model we did there. Um, repel is equal to two, label size is equal to three, adding um, the black and white theme, so theme underscore by. And then for our label of the title, we buy plot of MT cars data. Um, there's a bit more in the book about the buy plots. It was kind of complicated, so I didn't really go into it too much. But if you wanted to read more about it, it's section 9.2. Okay, and then we have bubble charts. So a bubble chart is basically just a scatter plot where the point size is proportional to the values of a third quantitative variable. And bubble charts are quite popular, but controversial for the same reason that pie charts are controversial, which is the fact that people are better judging length than volume. And here we use the empty cars data set to plot weight versus mileage and use point size to represent horsepower. So we call our data from empty cars and call um, the ggplot2 library. And then within the ggplot2 function, our data is the empty cars. And within aesthetics, our x is weight, our y is miles per gallon. And then the size is going to be based on the horsepower, which is HP. And then we're doing g on point for a scatter plot. So here you see our scatter plot. Again, our, the weight is on the x axis miles per gallon or MPG is on the Y axis. And then the size of each of the points is based on the horsepower. So then we're gonna modify that bubble chart. And so within the ggplot function, we again call our data empty cars and our, aesthetic, our aesthetics where X is equal to weight, Y is equal to MPG and the size is equal to horsepower. And then within GM point, we set our alpha equal to 0 0.5, which is the transparency. Fill is equal to cornflower blue, which will fill in the circle. And color is equal to black, which will outline the circle. And the shape is equal to two, which is like a, um, sorry, shape is equal to 21, which is, um, I guess it would be like not a filled circle. Well, circle that you're gonna fill in with the color. So we're filling it with the cornflower blue and outlining with black. And then the scale, scale underscore size underscore continuous range is equal to C1 through 14. And that controls the size of the bubbles themselves. And plus our labels, labs, um, title equal to auto mileage by weight and horsepower. And then our subtitle is Motor Trend US Magazine 1973 to 74 models. And our X's weight for by hundreds of pounds thousands of pounds, Y is miles per US gallon, and size is gross horsepower. So yeah. so yeah, so the range parameter within the scale, like I mentioned before, the range parameter within the scale underscore size underscore continuous function specifies the minimum and maximum size of the plotting symbol, uh, where the default is range is equal to C one through six. And here we have C one through 14. And you can see like the difference between this plot and the previous one is like the points here get way bigger and like it's easier to distinguish the difference. Um, also the same thing with having them setting the alpha, which is the transparency to 0.5 where the previous one, you might not see the points here overlapping um, in the previous plot. It's way easier to see here. Yeah, like you, if you see the difference here where there's a lot of overlap, but you can't really distinguish it. And again, the points weren't as big there. So then also um, the shape option in the GM point function specifies a circle with a border color and fill color. Like I mentioned, the border is the black and the fill is the cornflower blue. And then from this graph, we can generally see that the miles per gallon decreases with increased car weight and horsepower. So yeah. So here's miles per gallon, and yeah, it looks like it's kind of decreasing as weight increases, and you see the bubbles get bigger, so horsepower increases. So next we'll discuss flow diagrams. And a flow diagram represents a set of dynamic relationships by capturing the physical and metaphorical flow of people, materials, 
communications or objects through a set of nodes in a network. And two types of flow diagrams are Sankey diagrams and alluvial diagrams. In a Sankey diagram, the width of the line between the two nodes is proportional to the flow, and alluvial diagrams are a more rigidly defined subset of Sankey diagrams. So with Sankey diagrams, um, building the Sankey diagrams requires two data frames, one containing node names and the second containing the links between the nodes and the amount of flow between them. So let's look at UK energy forecast data, which contains energy production and consumption forecasts for the year 2050 to demonstrate the Sankey diagrams. And here, here we have two data frames, a links data frame with three columns from two and value, and a nodes data frame, which contain, which gives the names of each nodes. So the package we're gonna use is the network D3. We load that package and then we load the energy pro, um, projection data. So I had to get this data. I think I got it from, I'm gonna say the R graph gallery. The actual code in the book wasn't working for me, um, but it's the same data set. So it ends up with the same plot. So first, and again, we've, the data we got from that URL, we're assigning it to the name energy. So we're looking at um, energy and the links. So again, we have the data set with the source target and value, and then the nodes data set, um, just the names of them. Uh, the first six here, agricultural waste, bioconversion, liquid, losses, solid, and gas. Okay. And then, so here we're going to build the diagram using the Sankey network function in the network D3 package. And Sankey diagrams created with the network D3 package are not ggplot graphs, so they cannot be modified with ggplot2 functions. So we're creating object P, and we're assigning to that um, the function Sankey network. Our links are equal to energy links, nodes are equal to energy. Um, work nodes, source is equal to source, target is equal to target, value, node ID is equal to name, and the units TWH, which is optional name unit, optional unit names for pop-ups, font size is 12, and the node width is 30. And then we're calling that object created. And here is our Sankey diagram. And so following the flow from the left to the right, energy supplies are on the left and energy demands are on the right for example i guess the energy supply being nuclear and you see it flows to when it goes through i forgot what this one is oh, thermal generation and you see there's a bunch of losses and yeah i'm fairly new with sinky diagrams so i apologize if i'm not Playing it fully. And so, yeah, as you may have noticed, the graph is interactive. So, you're able to highlight nodes and drag them to new positions. It's kind of cool. Yeah. Something definitely to look at and play around with if you're interested in this. And then, so next, we'll have the alluvial diagrams. And when examining the relationship among categorical kind of variables, Alluvial diagrams can serve as alternatives to mosaic plots. In an alluvial diagram, blocks represent clusters of observations, and stream fields between the blocks represent changes to the composition of the clusters over time. Using the Titanic dataset will create alluvial diagrams with the GG alluvial package, which generates ggplot2 graphs. So our libraries are Redar and dplyr, and then the Titanic dataset we're getting from a CSV file we have and then we're creating a table um titanic underscore table so we're taking the titanic data and we're piping it to group by class um, class sex and survive and then piping to get the count and then within our table we're creating a field called survived and we're setting it as a factor of we're setting it as a factor with the levels of yes and no and then here we see the first three, first three observations within our table, where we have the class sex survived, and then survived the, the numbers of each. So yeah, our counts rather. 
And then, so, how oh, did I not? Hmm. Oh, that was just the data itself. Okay, so here we'll show the alluvial diagram. Um, so we use our libraries, ggplot2 and ggalluvial. And then we're going to take that data, data frame that we made before. And for our aesthetics, the axis one is equal to class, and axis two is equal to survived, and our y is equal to m. And then adding the geom gg alluvium and the aesthetics where fill is equal to sex plus geom stratum, and then geom text where stat is equal to stratum, and the aesthetics labels equal to after stat stratum, well, labels equal to the function after stat stratum plus the scale x discrete the limits um are class and survived and then yeah i didn't look into this too much to understand that um but then our labels the titic title is titanic data our sub subtitle is stratified by class sex and survival and our y is the frequency and then we did the normal to remove like the background. And yeah, also just to note, there is a difference. If you look at the book versus the code here, there is a difference within this versus what was in the book. I had issues getting the text to show up. Um, but yeah, so I had to find this when I looked up. I think when I looked up the GG Alluvial package, um, yeah, there was a difference between what was in the book and how to get the code to run. But yeah, so, oh, we have, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it took a bit, Benny says, same here, yeah, it took a bit to figure out what was wrong, <laughs> but yeah, so we have our, we have our plot here, where you see on the left-hand side, it has the class, which is first, second, third, and crew. And then on the right hand side, there's survived yes or no. Um, and then if you remember from previously when we looked at it, if you recall, um, oh, also to note the legend where females kind of like that salmon color and males kind of like a, a turquoise color, we'll say. So again, you'll remember from like our previous previous discussion last week that the crew was like the largest, the male crew specifically was the largest group of within the Titanic accident not to survive. You see that big block is like the male, male crews that didn't survive. And then up there is like, you could barely see the little salmon color, but also, also you see the amount of male crew that did survive and also the female crew. And then, yeah, and remember the male third class passengers we're also like the next largest group that did not survive. And you see, yeah, you see the female, female third class passengers that didn't survive. And then up here, you see the male and females that did survive. So yeah, you would start at the node on the left and follow the stream field to the right. And then the height of the blocks represents the proportion of observations in that cluster. And the height of the stream field represents the proportion of observations contained in both blocks they connect. For example, most crew are male and did not survive, as you can see. And then a much larger percentage of first class females survived than did male first class, first class males. So yeah, we see a lot of this salmon color again is females and the first class, a lot of them survived compared to the males. And then, yeah, and then you see down here, where it flows into didn't survive. And um, it's very faint, but you can see there were a number of first class female passengers that didn't survive, but yeah, it's not as noticeable in the graph. Okay, so then this is our modified alluvial diagram. And here's an alternative visualization where survived becomes an access and class becomes the fill color. And colors are chosen from the Veritas pa palette. And additionally, the legend is suppressed. So again, <coughs> our library is ggplot2 and ggalluvial. And within the ggplot, we're using the Titanic table um, data, data frame, and our aesthetics where axis one is equal to class, axis two is equal to sex, 
and x is three is equal to survived. So yeah, we have class here, sex, and survived. And then our y is equal to n, which are the counts. And then within gg, geom underscore alluvium, our aesthetics fill is equal to class um, plus geom stratum, geom underscore stratum plus geom text, um, where stat is equal to stratum and aesthetics label is equal to after stat stratum plus our scale underscore x underscore discrete with our limits or class sex and survived. And then scale fill veritas, scale underscore fill underscore veritas underscore D, which adds the palette. And then our labels where the title, the title is Titanic data. Our subtitle is stratified by class sex and survival. And Y is our frequency. And again, we do theme minimal to kind of get rid of the background and theme legend dot position is equal to none um, to remove the legend. And yeah, so here you see we have the three um, the three columns where the first one is class, second one is sex, and third one is survived. So reading from left to right, you can have, um, so before where the color was, the color was um, male or female or sex, here the color is um, just the class rather than that. So we see here the crew, the crew that are male go through here, and a lot of the male crew do not survive, but you do have some of the male crew that do survive, and also some of the female crew that do survive. And again, so if we look again at first class, first class females, a large amount of them do survive, and then you do have a small number of first class females that do not survive, and then the first class males, um, a lot of them do not survive as well. Okay, so heat maps. A heat map displays a set of data using colored tiles for each variable variable value within each observation. And although base R comes with the heat map function, the author uses the more powerful superheat package. Um, and the superheat function, the, within the superheat package, there is the superheat function and it requires that the data be in a particular format, specifically that the data must all be numeric. The row names are used to label the left axes and missing values are allowed. So we're gonna create our heat map. Our data is from empty cars. Our library is superheat. And then within the superheat function, we call our data set empty cars and scale is equal to true. Um, the scale equal to true option standardizes the columns to a mean of zero and standard deviation of one. So this is just like the basic heat map. Like we just added in our data set and equal put scales equal to true. You could see over here that like the names, which is like the individual cards, it's very like kind of like impossible to read basically. So in the next plot, we're gonna kind of deal with that. So a sorted heat map, we can use clustering to sort the rows and our columns. And in the example below, we'll sort the rows so that the cars that are similar appear ne near each other and adjust the text and label sizes. So here's our sorted heat map. So within the superheat function, we call our, our data set, which is MTP cars. Once again, scale is equal to true to have it. So um, I think it was, was it mean of zero and standard deviation of one. And then left dot label dot text dot size is equal to three. Um, bottom label bottom dot label dot text dot size is equal to three. Um, bottom label bottom dot label dot size is equal to zero point five. And oh zero point zero five. And row dot dendrogram is equal to true. So yeah, remember last time where um, the titles were like very hard to discern like what each one was saying so we changed the size of these yeah we decreased the size of these and then we did the same thing with the names down here and then yeah and then we added the dendrogram over here which is this thing which if you're familiar with clustering is something you would do in yeah we'll do it in clustering. 
Um, okay. So then we can also do a heat map for time series. And below we make a heat map to display changes in life expectancy over time for Asian, Asian countries using, using data from the Gapminder data set. And since the data is in long format, we'll first convert to wide format, ensure that the data is a data frame and convert the variable country into row names. And finally, we'll sort the data by 2007 life expectancy and change the color scheme. So first, okay. So first we call our libraries and then the data gapminder from the package gapminder. And then here we're gonna filter um, the countries that are in Asia. So within Asia, um, we're, this is our object and we're assigning it gapminder and we're gonna filter um, countries uh, from the continent where it's equal to Asia. So this is subsetting Asian countries. And then we want to select um, the columns year, country, and life expectancy. And then with, to make it convert it from long to wide, we're going to plot data and spread with Asia, year, and life expectancy. And then to make sure that it's a data frame, plot data, and we're assigning that as that data frame plot data. And then to save the country as row names, row.names plot data. Um, so that we're setting plot data extracting the country names. Um, and then plot data country is equal to null and sort dot order to order the rows um, based on 2007, the column 2007. Um, so then also to do the color, we're going to be using um, the R color bureau package. And yeah, this is our color scheme. Colors reverse brewer dot pal pal five blues. Yeah, that's our color scheme. And then within the superheat function, we're gonna use that plot data that we created, which we converted from long format to wide. And then scale is equal to false. Left dot label dot text is equal to size. Actually, these are the things we did previously. And then heat dot pal, which I'm guessing is a heat palette, is equal to the colors object we created up here. And then order dot rows is equal to sort order, which we created here. And then the title life expectancy in Asia. And here we see that plot we created. Created. Um, the author noted that um, something you can see is like there was like a drastic change in life expectancy. Well, the darker the color, the lower the life expectancy, and the lighter the color, um, the higher the life expectancy. So you see here, this is um, Democratic Republic of Korea, and you see it, the life expectancy was um, higher at one point, then it got lower, then kind of started getting higher again. And then I think it was Cambodia they mentioned where, Somewhere around 1977, the life expectancy decreased and then it kind of um, started increasing again. And then, so next we have radar charts. And a radar chart, also called a spider or star chart, displays one or more groups or observations from three or more quantitative variables. Radar charts can be created with GG radar, with the GG radar function. In the GG radar package. And unfortunately, the package is not available on CRAN. So we have to install it from GitHub. And we have to put the data in a specific format where one, the first variable is called group and contains the identifier for each observation. And two, the numeric variables are scaled so that their range, their values range from zero to one. So here this is where we're installing um, the package from GitHub. So dev tools install GitHub um, from the repo, Ricardo Biomes re repo, GG Radar. And then the data set we're going to use is msleep from the ggplot2 package. And we call the GG Radar, GG Radar package and scales in dplyr. So we're going to assign, create an object plot data using msleep 
and then we're going to filter um, based on names that are cow, pig, dog, or pig, and then select the columns name, sleep, total sleep, realm, sleep cycle, brain weight, and body weight, and rename the group is equal to name. Because again, they said the first variable called group contains the identifier for each object. Um, and then mutate underscore at um, variables. I forgot exactly what that's doing. And then I thought I'm missing something here. But yeah, so then here's the data we have. Sorry, give me one second. Okay, so here's the data set, the data that we have, and then let's plot it. So in the below example, we'll use the mammal sleep data to compare dogs, pigs, and cows in terms of body size, brain size, and sleep characteristics, which are total sleep time, length of sleep cycle, and the amount of REM sleep. And the data comes from the mSleep data set that ships with the GZPAT2 package. So using that data, data we created before, we put it within the ggradar function, and then grid.label.size is equal to four, axis.label.size is equal to four, group.point.size is equal to five, group.line.width is equal to 1.5, legend.text.size is equal to 10, and then we add the title, mammal, size, and sleep. You see here on our, like our, um, our legend, where this kind of reddish color is cow, the, bluish, the yellowish color is dog, and this greenish color is pig. So, yeah. Oh, okay. So the mutate at function rescales all variables except for the group. So that was, oh, that was in the previous one. And the size, the various size options control the font size for the percent labels and the variable names, point size, line width, and legend variables, respectively. And we could see from the chart that cows have large brain and body weights. Let me go to cows. Large brain and body weights, um, and short, short total sleep time, and little time in REM. Let me see. Not a period time. Okay, so each of the lines. So yeah, we have the lines here. That one's body weight, brain weight, sleep cycle, sleep realm, sleep total. So yeah, for cows, very high brain weight, body weight, sleep cycle, but low on sleep total and sleep realm. And then dogs have small body weight and brain weight, um, sleep cycles and large total sleep time and time in REM. So the dogs where that's the yellow, here again, high sleep total, high sleep REM, and then, but yeah, like um, relative to cows, they have low body weight, brain weight, and sleep cycle. And then, so next we're going to look at scatter, a scatter plot matrix. And a scatter plot matrix is a collection of scatter plots organized as a grid. And it is similar to a correlation plot, but instead of displaying correlation, it displays the underlying data. And you can create a scatterplot matrix using the ggpairs function in the ggli package. And we can illustrate its use by examining the relationships between mammal size and sleep characteristics. Um, brain weight and body weight are highly skewed. Think like the difference between a mouse and an elephant. So we'll transform them to log brain, brain weight and log body weight before creating the graph. So we call our library ggli. And then our data is the msleep M from the ggplot2 package. And then we're going to use the dplyr library. And then for our data frame, we're using msleep. And then we're mutating the data where we're creating object log underscore brain weight, which is the log of brain weight. And then log underscore body weight, which is the log of body weight. And then we're going to select log underscore brain weight, log underscore body weight sleep total and sleep REM. And then using the ggpairs function, we're going to plot that um, 
data frame to create our scatter plot matrix. And you see it here below, where you see the log brain weight, log body weight, sleep total, and sleep REM. And then you have, yeah, you have the correlation coefficients here. You have um, like the, oh God, why am I <laughs> blinking? And then, yeah, like the scatter plots here. Oh, histogram. Yeah, the histograms of it. Um, not histograms. Oh God. <laughs> okay, so the customized scatter plot matrix. So since Gigi Pairs creates a oh, density plot, I don't know if yeah, density. Okay, since Gigi Pairs creates a G plot two graph, additional functions can be added to alter the theme, title, and labels. And so we're going to customize a function for a destiny density plot. Um, those are these, the density plots, where my underscore density function of data mapping and then ggplot2 where data is equal to data, mapping is equal to mapping, plus GM density where the alpha for transparency is equal to 0 0.5 and the fill is equal to cornflower blue. And here you see that where these are the density plots, I'll make them 50% transparent. And then we'll have the custom functions for the scatter plot. Here you see they're like compared to the previous one, the points are like transparent, light blue, and there's a line. Um, wait, one second. Okay, so yeah, for my scatter plot for function data mapping, the ggplot to data is equal to data, mapping is equal to mapping. And then the gm point off is equal to 0 0.5, the color is equal to cornflower blue. And then we add a GM smooth, the method is linear. And then SE equals false. So we don't have like the um, confidence interval or standard error. And then we're going to create our scatter plot matrix um, using GG pairs. We use that um, data frame DF. And lower is equal to this continuous my scatter, my scatter, which was the custom scatter plot. And then the diagonal is the density that we created. And then the title, again, mammal size, sleep characteristics, and the theme underscore BW. So yeah, so again, we see our scatter plots where you have the points that are light blue, and we have our um, geom smooth there for the, um, the line it creates. And then we have our density plots that are on the diagonal here. Okay. And then Ken had a comment. Okay. Um, yeah, so Ken was saying GGPair is a lot more useful than the standard pairs function. And he likes how much it's um, info it gives about the distribution, each of the variables and the variables correlation. Yeah, totally agree. It's it's a lot of information here and very useful for sure. So next we have the waterfall charts. Um, a waterfall chart illustrates the cumulative effect of a sequence of positive and negative values. Um, so we'll create a data set to plot the cum cumulative effect of revenue and expenses for a fictional company um, using the waterfall function in the waterfalls package. So here we're going to create a company income. Um, the categories are sales, services, fixed costs, variable costs, and taxes. And then our amounts are going to be um, 101,000, 52,000, negative 23,000, negative 15,000, and negative 10,000. And then we're going to create our data, our data frame called income based on the categories and the amounts. And then using the ggplot2 library and the waterfalls library, we're going to plot that data, creating our waterfall chart using the waterfall function and just putting in that data frame we created income. And so you see it here where um, sales, so yeah, sales we have a 100, a 101,000, and then it increases with the services by 52,000. And then we have that decrease of 23,000, not the decrease of 15,000, 15, and then decreases 
um, 10,000. And then here, um, since the waterfall function um, creates a ggplot2 graph, we can use additional functions to customize the results. So below, we'll add a total or net column, and we're going to create the waterfall chart with the um, total column. So within the waterfall function, we're going to call that data frame we created income, where we'll calculate total is equal to true, and the total axis total underscore axis underscore tax is equal to net and total underscore rect underscore tax underscore color is equal to black and the total total underscore rect underscore color is equal to golden rod one plus scale y continuous where we're going to add a label um label the scale one dollars and then we have our labels title is equal to west coast profit and loss where our subtitle is year 2017. And then we're removing the labels for the X and the Y um, by putting Y is equal to like nothing within those parentheses, same for the X and using the minimal. So here you see, and yeah, what all of this is doing, let me see. So total um, access text here where it says net, um, the rectangle text color within it is the black, and then the color of the rectangle itself is the golden rod one. And then, yeah, the previous, previously in the previous one, we didn't have the dollar signs here, but here we do have the dollar signs. And basically, what it shows you here, is you add, we end up adding these two, these two amounts, and then we're subtracting those, and we get to our net value of 100, 105,000. So then lastly, we have word clouds. So a word cloud, also called a tag cloud, is basically an infographic that indicates the frequency of words in a collection of text, such as tweets, a text document, or a set of text documents. And here we use the word cloud two package and the demo freak um, data set, which contains files of words and their frequency, and it ships with that word cloud two package. So we're going to call the word cloud to library. And then I don't show you here, but we can have a look at that data set later. And then the most basic plot for word cloud two, you call data is equal to demo, demo prep, and then size is equal to 1.6. And again, if you're reading along in the book, um, for me, I don't know if it was just me, I couldn't get the word cloud in the book to work. Like, let me show you yeah the word cloud in the book i couldn't get it to work i think it was something to do with like the actual file running the file so that's why i ended up using a different package which was word cloud too and i found it um this one i found on i want to say the r graph gallery i did find it on the r graph gallery but this is like the cram the cram web page for it but yeah it looked pretty cool all of the different things you can do with it so yeah i'll put that let me put that in the chat uh, okay so yeah word cloud two and then, yeah, I think I've seen it on our graph gallery. Chart times. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, there's the Word Cloud 2 package. And then there's also another package. Um, but based on this website, they more so. Um, Suggest Word Cloud too. And then let me go back to the presentation. Okay. Yeah. And then all I have left was like some resources I added, which were that page I just showed you from the Argraph Gallery for Word Clouds. And then also one for Sankey charts. Um, yeah, because I think this was the one where. I couldn't get the the previous 
the code from the book to it. So I think I was able, yeah. So they have the same code, but using, yeah, this is the code for this chart, which is the same as the one in the book. Yeah, it's the same plot as the one in the book. So I was able to go there for chart code and just get the code right from here. So I'll also add that in the chat. And I think those were the main things that I had changed, I wanna say. Yeah, but yeah, so if anyone has any questions or if you wanna see anything specifically about the code, I could show you that as well. Yeah, we have about eight minutes left. Oh, I didn't realize it took that much time. <laughs> we have about eight minutes left. So yeah, let me know if anyone has questions and I can stop sharing or if you wanna see anything in particular. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Lillian, for the presentation. Okay, for my own, and what I want to uh, say is based on, I think the 3D, I did not know that we have plots 3D package already until when I read this chapter, because earlier on, I think I was playing around with the ray shader, I think ray shader, it fits very well with uh, ggplot2. But until when I read uh, the chapter, that is why is, I saw that there is also another package that we I can use for the 3D uh, plot. I think it's a very good chapter because I learned a lot about, uh, I think, different uh, chat type, which uh, they really discuss in this chapter. I think it was very useful to me. Thank you very much. Yeah, same. I really like this chapter because, like, I think beside, like, maybe like the scatter plot matrix and like bubble charts and also heat maps to an extent, like a lot of those charts were pretty much new to me. So I really, really liked this chapter, but yeah. And yeah, does anyone, anyone else have any comments? Same, the heat map was very new to me as well. Yeah, it was pretty cool. But yeah, so I guess that will be, we can end the meeting here today. Um, thank you all for joining. And then next week we'll be going over customizing glass. And I know last time I said Femi, like I was like, Femi is gonna do chapter nine, this like this week, but it's actually next week. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Femi, you're doing um, customizing graphs next week, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So yeah. Thank you all for joining and hopefully see you same place, same time next week. All right. Have a good day. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.